Hi, I'm Michelle Cook. And I'll be just voicing from here on out. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And uh, as a visual description, I'm a white woman with brown and gray hair about shoulder length. I'm wearing a black shirt with patterns on it and a black sweater sitting in my blurred home office. And um, I am a professor of geosciences at the University of Massachusetts. And so I really wanna thank the Academy for the putting together this important series of talks and also for giving uh, space for this, this complicated issue of field accessibility. And uh, I'll emphasize as other speakers have in this series that my point of view is mine alone based on my perspective. And I'm very excited that this recorded talk will be adjacent to uh, the talk of Dr. Marshall, who's done incredible work on making field trips accessible. This um, image that you're seeing here on the left is a artificial intelligence art created using the words of this uh, series, the leading practices for improving accessibility and inclusion in field and laboratory science. I thought it was an interesting interpretation of those words. Also, I'll point out I'm using real-time auto caption, which is built into PowerPoint. You can also access the transcriptionist produced captions. If you click the button at the bottom of the screen, I'm including the real-time captions just to show that it's really easy with a click of a button, you can get real-time auto captions for any presentation. Although I'll also point out that they are prone to error and more greater error than a human transcriptionist. So if someone ever requests caption, you should always honor that by hiring a transcriptionist. And of course, if someone requests interpreters, you should hire an interpreter. But for all other presentations, why not add real-time captions to every presentation? So there's my plug for that. So I wanted to start with um, why, what perspective I have to share. I mentioned that I'm just one person. And so I wanted to tell you some of what I've done in the past that has led to my current perspective on accessible field trip field work, especially in geosciences. Um, when I was an undergrad, uh, I was a teaching assistant who was asked to work with a blind student who had enrolled in the in introductory geology class. So I was a senior at the time and she was in the class and it was clear that the lab and field trip materials were not going to be accessible to her. So the professors hired me to help her out. I guess he was thinking, put the deaf one with the, the blind one. I don't know, not sure what his reasoning was there. Um, but in the course of that, I didn't have, had no structure. I had no resources. We just kind of worked through things together. And I learned a lot. I mean, we tried things that didn't work. We changed, we pivoted. I learned a lot from her about what works. And I recognize now in retrospect, that that was actually a really great uh, experience, an opportunity for me because I wasn't the instructor. I didn't really have preconceived notion on what the way that she should learn things. And so it became more of a partnership of working together to learn the context. Um, at the time it was a little overwhelming, but I see it now as a great opportunity. Then um, when I was in grad school, I was involved in a project to adjust introductory geology field trips to be accessible with folks with mobility impairments. So I was involved with the disabled student group on campus and became friends with folks. There's an image here on the left, it's a black and white picture, and it shows four people. Two are sitting on the ground next to a bin full of rocks. There's one person sitting in a wheelchair, and then there's one person standing leaning over, and that's the younger version of myself who's standing and leaning over and picking up a rock. And one of my friends who's sitting in the wheelchair in this picture told me at the time, we were talking about what I was studying as a PhD student. And she said, you know, geology sounds really interesting, but I would never take a class because it's inaccessible to me. And I was like, well, heck, we need to change that. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous that you can't take be on the field trip. 
So um, with some, her guidance and help, um, and also the guidance and help of two grad students, one of whom is sitting in this picture, he's wearing the plaid shirt and sitting next to the bin of rocks, um, and him and another grad student, we redesigned all of the introductory field trips to be accessible. And um, it was successful in that um, my friend sitting in the wheelchair here, she ended up double majoring in earth science. So in that way, it was incredibly successful. It was also unsuccessful in some key ways in that once I graduated and the other grad students graduated, they went right back to the old field trips and abandoned our plans and our new curriculum. So, but another benefit, so coming back to successes, what I, another thing I learned through this was uh, how to advocate for change and how to advocate for making things accessible because we got a lot of pushback in this project and, and seeing how it wasn't sustainable also taught me a lot about um, access and, and these efforts. And uh, I do have a note here under the picture that this was published in a paper. I think this is the first paper about accessible geology field trips um, in geosciences. So another sort of opportunity I had was once I landed here at UMass and was pre-tenure focused on doing my research and building my um, research record, I saw that NSF had this, uh, propo this proposal opportunity called a career proposal, which blends both your research and some form of outreach. And while, and it was fantastic timing for me because while I was sort of going with my research, having this opportunity uh, allowed me to do some outreach, which was to lead three field trips for teachers and students at seven high schools for the deaf around the country. They were from all over. And um, we did field trips in Utah, New England and California. And on the left is a photograph from Arches National Park. And there's two people in the foreground. One is younger version of me, no gray in my hair there. And one of the students wearing a baseball cap. We have our field notebooks in front of us and colored pencils in my left hand. Students also holding his pencil and I'm signing left. I don't remember what I was saying, but I was probably giving the student some feedback on his sketch of the faults that we were sketching outside the park. So um, that was a really great experience to, uh, to work with those students and especially the teachers uh, 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 from those high schools for the deaf, most of whom who were not trained in geosciences. So it was a, a great opportunity. And then of course, I continued to teach field courses and participate on field trips. Uh, and so I provide this just as a context, where am I coming from? So that's kind of where I am, I've developed. So um, we know about universal design and learning, which is a teaching approach that works to accommodate the needs and abilities of all learners and eliminates unnecessary hurdles in the learning process. And so the question here is, what is universal design in field work then? A lot of our efforts to make field trips accessible tend to fit more on the retrofit approach side rather than the universal design side. We aren't necessarily, especially pre-pandemic especially, we weren't necessarily designing field trips to be accessible and designing that learning that would happen in field trips to be accessible or the research to be in on field work to be accessible. We were more just retrofitting to try to squeeze people in as best we could. And so um, I'm really interested in the discussions we're gonna have on how we can universal design for field work. And so in thinking about this, I assembled five obstacles that I saw for accessible field experiences, be they uh, research related or teaching related. And I'm sure there's more, but these are the five I came up with and this talk will kind of work on weakening each of these obstacles. And the first one is we've always done things this way. This was something I saw in redesigning field trips in grad school. 
there's an outcrop that's perceived as the best outcrop. You have to get your hands on this. There's no way we're going to change our field trip so that that outcrop is not involved. That's a very uh, strong view in a lot of people's ways. Or we've always camped. We, we, we're going to camp because everybody likes it. We've always uh, camped in tents, and that's what we're going to do. Um, the second one is glorification of challenging field conditions. Uh, a lot of geologists like to talk about the time they were in some remote place, taking the helicopter, getting dropped off, having to climb 4,000 feet to get to the outcrop. Uh, this sort of, uh, that's part of the culture of field-based sciences, which leads to the third one of ableism and the discrimination and harassment of disabled folks, but this becomes amplified in the field where you also got a culture of sort of glorifying ability. Uh, the fourth is, I put this in quotes, as a misconception, I don't have any disabled folks in my group, so I don't need to change anything. I would say you don't think you have any disabled folks in your group, but you probably do. And then the last one is resistance to disclosure, which is related to that second one. Why are we not disclosing? Of course, there's lots of reasons not to disclose, but what can we do to make it safer to disclose disability when being involved in field work? So these are probably not new to you. Um, what my, this, I'm going to sort of go through and, and by the end of this, this short talk, have given tools for how we and approaches for how we can uh, weaken these obstacles. So we've always done things this way. <laughs> this one um, it is there's a, a lot of great, a great uh, ways we can uh, sort of resist this obstacle. This image I'm showing is from a recent paper by Berkey that points out how the instead of a leaky pipeline, we should be thinking of it as a hostile optical course. The image shows a um, white male pre presenting person in the business attire on the left, and he's ascending a set of steps and has to navigate around um, some safety cones, and there are some arrows showing him which way to go in his path up the flight of steps. And on the right is a feminine presenting, black presenting person in professional attire ascending ostensibly the same set of steps, but this time the steps have spikes and barbed wire and traps and spears and fire, and some of the steps are damaged. And the image is conveying this idea of, while well, it is the same flight of steps, it's a different environment that one is climbing them. And, um, and of course, in the context of our conversation, we can be thinking about people at the intersection of disability and other minoritized group, while the person on the right has a very difficult path ahead of her. If she were also mobility impaired and used uh, mobility aids, this path, the path would be impossible. So just, this, uh, yeah. So we've always done things this way. We probably shouldn't, <laughs> as uh, you all probably appreciate. The other reason is something that other keynotes have brought up is the underrepresentation of disabilities in STEM. And I'm showing it the same data presented by another keynote. I'm showing it now graphically with circles um, representing sort of population and uh, the yellow or, or yellowish orange circles represent the folks within the population with disabilities at the undergrad level, about 11 to 13% of undergrads have disabilities at graduate student level, seven to eight. And then when it comes to faculty and staff in STEM it's down to 4% compared to the 20% of US working age adults. So we see it's, because we've done things this way, it's no surprise then that we see uh, sharp underrepresentation of people and disabilities within STEM, uh, especially. Uh, yeah. And I'm also showing in here the um, sort of laws that support our accommodations. So just pointing out, as has been before, that undergrads 
benefit from both ADA, but more importantly, Section 504 of the Education Reform Act um, to get their accommodations. Grad students can also use Section 504, while faculty and staff in STEM don't have that legal support. We um, and ADA accommodations at, at that level are um, not consistent between institutions and yeah, are less support. Okay, glorification of challenging field condition. So I grabbed these two pictures from the website of one of my alma maters. So if you see my CV, you can go find which school. And, um, and, this, and it just shows how the department is promoting itself in, in these photos. And the picture on the left is a picture of a tent on a ridge. And in the distance are uh, rugged mountains in the distance and there's not much vegetation around. And the photo on the left is a group of people walking through a sort of narrow cleft in the rocks with the sea in the distance. And it looks like a pretty steep slope down to the sea. And so what the department intends when they use these as their promotional images is for folks perspective, students to look at the go, wow, I wanna go there. I wanna be part of that group. But the message that they might be getting is, you know, when people see this tent, they might be thinking, or I might be thinking, if I go there, how am I gonna recharge my assistive listening devices? If I use medication, I might be thinking, where, how am I gonna keep my medications refrigerated on this trip? Or um, there's no vegetation. I might also be thinking, how am I gonna use the restroom on this trip? Or I might be thinking, how am I even gonna get to, the, to that cleft in the rocks? So um, these are the questions that are asked by the people who haven't typically been part of the community. So the community tends to self-perpetuate the idea of these images as drawing the people like them to the field without realizing how othering it is to the people who haven't been part of the field. And so um, this, uh, I have another image here. It's an old black and white image with people in sort of uh, clothing from probably 100 years ago or so of a U.S. geologic survey field topographic mapping crew. And my point here is the exclusive nature of fieldwork is perpetuated by leaders who don't recognize their blind spots, right? If uh, fieldwork is only field leaders are thinking about the struggles they personally have had in the past with field trips, then they're not necessarily thinking about the folks who need to um, refrigerate their medications or charge in their assistive lessening devices and other um, accommodation needs. The next bit is ableism. And I find this definition of academic ableism particularly helpful. I'm, I have a, showing an image of the front cover of J. Timothy Dolmage's book by that name, Academic Ableism. This book he has made it available for download for free and it's very readable. So highly recommend reading this if you haven't. And here's one of my favorite quotes from the book. The ethics of higher education still encourages teachers and students alike to accentuate ability, valorize perfection and stigmatize anything that hints at intellectual or physical weakness. So, while ableism is part of our culture, it's even amplified within higher education because our metrics of success are so based on, on, norm, on able-bodied metrics of success. And so this, I, uh, this definition, I think, really helps me see just how uh, academia is framed in a way that is um, harmful to disabled folks. And so this is our charge, right? How do, we, how do we weaken this? And how do we make people more aware of the academic ableism all around us? And this is gonna come back in another way because ableism also has a manifestation in terms of internalized ableism. Like when we doubt ourselves, when we don't speak up, when I don't disclose my disability, that's coming from my own uh, resistance to be affiliated with the stigma 
of disability. So I'm going to take a little bit of time here to talk about where that stigma comes from, because I find that one of the ways to think about reducing that stigma is to put names and see where it's coming from so I can uh, push it further away from me. So um, the abled gaze, Western literature uses physical disability as outward expressions of character flaws. Here's an image, um, Captain Hook from the Peter Pan movie. And so that's just one example. The bad guy it had, doesn't have a hand and instead has a hook. And this is both an outward reflection of his character flaws. We see this all the time. It's, it's everywhere in our culture this othering of disability. Um, we also have that Judeo-Christian religious text teach that affliction comes from sin or deviation from righteous behavior. And disabled folks like me counter that all the time. What's the first question we get if we disclose our disability? What happened to you? How did that happen? And people want to know, what did we do wrong? Who, who made the sin? Where's the deviation from righteousness? I mean, maybe not sin and righteousness, but they want to know what happened. Sometimes stuff happens and there's no reason for it. And people don't recognize that question as a microaggression. It's really coming from this idea that something, somebody must have done something in order for a disability, someone to have a disability. So both of these, promote the stigma of disability. Both of these aspects are around us all the time in the US. So we're not gonna change all this, but what we can do is just recognize it when it comes up. When someone asks us, what happened to you? We can say, oh, there you go. You're trying to figure out what, what original sin might have caused this. <laughs> kind of helps keep that stigma at a distance. All right, here's a difficult one. This is um, the charity model of disability. And I'm showing uh, an, a video clip that's repeating. It's when Joe Biden was on the presidential campaign trail and he encountered a, a male presenting disabled person who uses a wheelchair. The person is wearing a t-shirt that says, without communication, there is no freedom. And Joe Biden is leaning over and stroking his neck and saying, your disability does not define who you are. And this is very difficult <laughs> clip to watch. I believe the Joe Biden campaign got a lot of criticism from the disabled community from this and they recognized that it was a, not a great move. I bring this as an example to show stories of able folks helping the disabled don't center disabled voices, right? This man's t-shirt has a very important message, but this video clip is not conveying that message. The hero of this video clip is, is the, camp, the guy on the campaign trail who's being charitable and benevolent and to the disabled person rather than um, the important message of the disabled person. All right, we're gonna stop watching that very difficult clip. So this framing shows up in education all the time because we have this framing of able bodies instructors accommodating disabled students. And this fuels the charity and benevolence model. When you talk about disabilities in the classroom, everybody immediately pictures disabled student, able-bodied instructor. When if 20% of the working age adults have disabilities, chances are one out of five classrooms, the, the instructor has a disability. If you're going into the field trip, you've also got uh, occurrences of disability. So I wanna put this there to say, you know, we need to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of thinking about disabilities only on the, um, in the students and the people we're providing a service to, because that then contributes more to this um, benevolence model. And also erodes this last point that disabled folks are the experts. If we go into a field trip thinking, oh, there's a person with a disability in my trip, I need to provide accommodations and service to them. And we fall prey to um, putting on that benevolence role on ourselves of being the good charitable person, we have now uh, not centered the expertise that they bring to this conversation. They're the experts at what they can and can't do. They're the experts on what can work and what might not. 
and we need to really let go of trying to be the do-gooder in this in this approach and really see it more as a team teamwork between not just the field trip leader and the disabled person but even the whole field crew so we'll talk some more on that too so all of this stigmatization leads to why people don't disclose disability so Reason not to disclose your disability if you have that option. I should also point out some people don't have this option. Um, with my own disability, uh, people uh, used to pick up on it more, uh, but I find as I've gotten older, I they generally don't hear my my an accent in my speech. I, I don't know. I, sometimes they do. So generally, I, I choose to disclose. But the reason not to disclose are what I've pointed out, this um, stigmatism, the internalized ableism, not wanting to be associated with that othering that happens in our society for people with disabilities, facing discrimination, facing harassment. And so it's not surprising that uh, studies have shown that only 39% of employees with disabilities have disclosed these to their manager. And this would include invisible and, dis in, invisible and visible disabilities. So there, this is from the workplace, but there's no reason to think that these numbers would be any different on any field trip that we're leading. The benefits of disclosing is, well, firstly, you can get access to accommodations. That's the first thing. And then also a secondary one is a possible sense of belonging within the CRIP community. So there, there's a lot of empowerment that can be gained from sort of joining with people, uh, other people in the disabled community and recognizing our common lived experiences. So um, disclosing, even before you get to the point of deciding whether to dis disclose or not, there's a huge challenge of diagnosis. You can't get accommodation unless you have diagnosis and, and the thing is, having a diagnosis is privileged. Within the US, whites with learning disabilities are far more likely to have a diagnosis than blacks with learning disabilities. Disability diagnoses take time, they take money, and they take advocacy. It can take years sometimes to take, get a diagnosis. Learning disability, it can take hundreds of dollars for the test. And then once you have a diagnosis, access to resources is far from equitable. Um, until I got my current job at the University of Massachusetts, hearing aids were never covered by insurance. This is the first time, and they're not 100% covered either, but I got this job, I couldn't believe it. What? You pay part of hearing aid cost? Do I need my hearing aids for my job? Absolutely. Can I do my job without them? No, <laughs> not at all. But yet it was never covered by insurance. Um, in fact, it's why I was diagnosed in kindergarten when a kindergartner teacher noticed that when she spoke, I stopped playing and watched her. And I'm really thankful that she was well trained to recognize that as a sign that I was speech reading her. And so she recommended I get tested. But my parents couldn't afford hearing aids at that time. So I went, I had to go till a few years later till I got my first hearing aids, which my audiologists now are shocked that that would happen. I, I like to think it's better now and that there's financial resources. And mine is just one story, but I just wanna say like, you can't assume that everyone has access to a diagnosis if they need it. And you can't assume that they have access to resources even with that diagnosis. Okay, so another point is uh, spoon theory or sometimes also called disability tax, or sometimes also called death tax. And it's the idea that disabled, mad, and chronically ill folks spend time and energy navigating their day. The analogy of you have only so many spoons that you start out with in a day, and each time you need to spend extra energy navigating your world, you're taking a spoon out. Um, and this is all just, you know, waking up, getting where you need to be, getting dressed, getting eating, managing conversation. And this is before you add the significant challenges 
of field work to the mix. Um, and so the example I have here, the listening fatigue for myself, I noticed a few years back that some days after work, I was just wiped out. I was really useless in the evening. And so I started tracking, oh, well, how many meetings did I have that day? And so I started tracking how many meetings with hearing people listening meetings I had versus how fatigued I was. And through this process, I learned that for myself, I have about three hours of listening each day that I can do. And if I do more than that, I run out of spoons. And so this means that I can need to think about how I manage my day. Now, if I'm in the field, working with a field crew all day, that's more than three hours right there. So by the afternoon, I'm done. <laughs> but the field trip keeps going into the evening. Um, and so what happens is, is just running on fumes and becoming really run down and exhausted is a typical experience for me. This is not unlike what other folks will need to do who need to manage their own health and their own um, accommodation. We're all kind of putting in that extra labor on top of getting to the outcrop and participating and, and the energy that our, our able-bodied uh, able body mind folks are participating in the field trip. So this is an interesting thought then. So how do we build into field work the breaks and the downtime and the recharge that people will need and that able-bodied folks would benefit from as well? Um, the accommodation process, uh, when a student has an accommodation in a classroom at the university, they could work with the disabled student services. And often there's a sort of set set of um, accommodations that can be offered. For me, it would be things like captioning and, um, and, and maybe using a microphone and things like that. When you go into do field work, the situations are really unusual and the plug and play accommodations that work in the classroom don't necessarily work in the field disabled person, unless they have experience with field work, they might not even be aware of what is expected of them. So they can't even articulate, they can't always articulate how their needs will be best met. And then there's no transparent process for, um, for deciding on and adjusting the accommodation. Once you're out there in the field, the the lead of the field crew is the boss, and they're the ones who decide if something comes up, what is reasonable accommodations or not. And so this negotiation in the field about accommodations can be pretty tricky um, for folks to, um, to navigate. And then the last point is that access is situational. So I brought up the example before about how folks might have more spoons in the morning than they do in the evening. Um, another example, I was on one field trip and I was using my assistive listening device. So the speaker wears a um, transmitter, a microphone transmitter, and then I have the receiver and it allows me to get the sound to my hearing aids so I'm not hearing the wind and the conversation near me, I can hear the speaker. Um, this particular field trip was really hot and humid. It was, it was kind of gross out, but the rocks were lovely. The speaker was sweating profusely. <laughs> it was kind of gross. He sweated so much that his sweat got into the microphone that he was wearing, the transmitter, and shorted it out. So uh, even though I had done all due diligence and charged everything and everything was set to go, I hadn't anticipated that he would sweat so much that the transmitter would die in the middle of the field trip. Uh, yeah, and no, insurance doesn't cover that repair. <laughs> so access is situational. You can say that just because someone managed perfectly fine yesterday, they may not manage perfectly fine the next day. Um, and we need to think about the, the changes that can arise. Okay, so things that you can assume. Uh, so any field crew will include folks with disability, including chronic illness and mental illness. And your field work will be accessible to at least some of the time for some of the participants. 
and uh, this is what I meant by situational, like someone might have, be, have fine access one day, but not another day. And another thing to assume is that the first solution you try won't work. I've seen this in all of my work in the field, especially in the field where condition, conditions can change, but also it's, it's a lot, there's a lot to process on top of, uh, of the work. Um, there's personal dynamics and a lot of things come into play, which leads to your field crew will include folks with strong ableist attitudes. So as a field crew supervisor, you might do your best to sort of center the disabled person's voices and their needs and their expertise and the decision-making. But maybe you're in a large enough field group that people are off in pairs. And so if, if their field partner has strong ableist attitudes, that's gonna get in the way of their access. Um, I've often heard people disparaging the fitness of their field partners in the classes that I teach. And we as instructors in that scenario need to do our best to make it clear that it's the responsible uh, responsibility of everyone in the group to ensure that each person has access and to sort of um, dispel that bullying that can happen within uh, a field partnership. Another example I have of the ableist attitudes that I wasn't prepared for was on one of the field trips with the School for the Deaf. Um, I combined my hearing college classroom with the deaf high school students and we visited, we were to get together on the field trip. And for some of the field stops, for, for many of them actually, I would teach in ASL rather than speaking as I had with my hearing class for the rest of the term. So it was a different mode than they were used to. And I didn't voice to keep the language clear. I was only presenting in one language in ASL and the interpreter was voicing with me. And my hearing students <laughs> really didn't like not having direct access to what I was saying and having to go through the interpreter. And they balked really hard about this. Um, what made it even more awkward is when I would ask questions of the group and sort of, you know, see where people were going. The deaf high school students, they were phenomenal. They had this. They were hitting all the marks. They were getting all the concepts. They were putting pieces together. And my hearing students were lost. Uh, keep in mind, these are hearing college students who've already taken three years of geology compared to high school students who are just learning it right then. So, um, so they were a little embarrassed by that too. And, you know, in retrospect, I see now that they just weren't prepared. I didn't prepare my hearing students well enough to be in that position where their language wasn't centered in the teaching. Um, so, but it was also, uh, their attitudes were unexpected to me. So I think we all learned something from that experiment. Um, just a few more points here. I mentioned before that retrofit versus universal design, that retrofit is kind of goes against universal design in that with retrofit, we're saying, oh, there's someone who needs me to do something different. Okay, I'll jury rig this solution versus really thinking about how to design a field trip that is by it's the way it's designed has built-in flexibility to accommodate the situations that come up, being ready to pivot to for other solutions. And so this idea that accommodations are um, traditionally provided through the lens of the medical or functional model. So with a retrofit, you're looking at what's your diagnosis, what can you do, what can't you do? And you're looking at that functional model of disability Whereas if you move more towards universal design and centering disabled voices, you can move more to a cultural and social model where it's not that the person needs fixing, but that the field trip and the way it's built needs to be adjusted to be more accessible. I think, yeah. And then this last point I wanted to bring about is what I call cripping the lab and, and field and classroom too. Uh, a radical shift happens in how we learn and research when the classroom, lab, and field trip 
are led by people with disabilities and center experiences, body, minds, and movement that are outside of the norm. And in the background, I'm showing a, a normal distribution curve. And uh, I'll show, share an example of this. So on one of the field trips that I led with the deaf students, we were, which was with high school students, we were measuring the orientation of a particular plane of the rock. So the rock surface would be here and we take out a compass. And with the compass, we take a series of measurements that then tell us the orientation of that surface. Is it straight up and down? Is it dipping off at an angle? Is it uh, pointed to the north? Is it pointed to the south? So there's measurements we can take to basically define that plane in space. And uh, I teach this to my hearing students, college students as well. When I teach it in uh, spoken English to my college students, it takes them a couple hours really to master this technique. We have to explain it, we have to practice it, we we'll work on it, I coach them. And I had an interesting experience where teaching the deaf students in ASL the same technique, I was able to harness with ASL, the um, spatial grammar that's built into ASL. I was able to say, okay, that way north, we're gonna measure angle clockwise from north and I could indicate it with my hand and I could show how the compass would then take that measurement and I could talk about measurements from horizontal and demonstrate it in ASL. And they picked it up so quickly. They were taking measurements within a half an hour. Actually within 20 minutes, they were taking measurements and then I did a little coaching and by a half an hour, they were taking reliable measurements. Um, I'm not gonna say that those students were exceptional. They're all great students. There's no difference in, in, in the way they think. The difference was the way it was taught, right? Because I was teaching in a graphic, a, a spatial based language and they were receiving it in, with that context, they could learn it faster and so, are there ways then that I could go to my hearing students and start using, I get, obviously they don't know ASL, I'm not gonna teach them ASL, but can I use gestures? Can I get them using gestures as a way to facilitate their learning of the measurement techniques? This is something I'm definitely trying in my own teaching. And I use it as an example of this shift, right? Why teach it the way it's always been taught? If we start to look at other ways to teach, we might, end up teaching it better. If we look at other ways to do field work, we, we're gonna end up with better field work, kind of. And the key to that, I think, a key to that is to center the experiences of disabled uh, people in the field, in the lab, in the classroom. All right, I'm gonna come back to this uh, slide from the beginning that talked about obstacles to accessible field experiences. I've tried to provide in this talk some way to kind of erode the, we've always done things this way, you know, the glorification of challenging field conditions, ableism. I don't have any disabled folks in my group, so I don't need to change anything. And the resistance of folks to disclose their disability. Uh, in this talk, I've tried to provide some approaches and strategies for eroding these obstacles, and I look forward to the panel discussion where we can talk about this some more. Thank you. <laughs>